This program is intended to be general in nature and should not be used as a substitute for advice from a qualified health provider. On Health Matters Television for Life, do you know a troubled teen? Mental health disorders affect one in four children. From anxiety to ADHD, our panel looks at the most common disorders facing kids today. Plus, I'm Katherine Anderson, family therapist at Sacred Heart. I'm going to be sharing with you five warning signs that a teenager you care about may be depressed. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Arnie Peterson, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I work at Sacred Heart for Providence Medical Group. When I needed my hip replaced, I chose Providence because of the professionalism and the care that I knew I'd receive. I never thought twice about going anywhere else. My name is Beth Perez, and I am a registered nurse, and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child, and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with, and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust? Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens, and welcome to another edition of Health Matters. As we embark on a very frank discussion of childhood and adolescent mental health, it's a very big topic to be sure, and we wanna cover as much ground as possible tonight. So we'll explore the most common disorders facing our kids from anxiety and depression to ADHD. We'll also talk about suicide, which on many people's minds this week in light of the news out of Washington State University about a quarterback taking his own life. At, it is our hope that this show will bring you new insight and understanding on a number of topics. Let's meet our panel for tonight who will help us uh, answer our questions. Dr. Kevin Hyde is a PhD in psychology and specializes in clinical child psychology and adolescent psychology. He works at Providence Psychology in Spokane. Kathy McEndifer is a licensed independent clinical social worker at Northwest Neurobehavioral Institute. Tamara Sheehan is the Director of Behavioral Health for Providence Healthcare. She's also a registered nurse. And Trevor Leibing is a child mental health specialist at Frontier Behavioral Health. He has a master's degree in applied psychology. And I wanna welcome all of you to our discussion tonight. We appreciate you being here for this very important topic. And then we welcome your emails and phone calls as well. We would like you to join the conversation and take advantage of this incredible panel that we have provided for you tonight. Um, we are talking more and more about depression and suicide, and that is, that's a good thing. We're, we're bringing those topics more into light. However, we still seem to have a growing problem with suicide. What are we missing, Dr. Hyde? It's interesting that the, uh, the science around uh, trying to inform us about suicide and, and uh, risk and prevention, that has been advancing um, consistently for the last several years. Unfortunately, um, accessibility to treatment has not been keeping pace with the advances in science. Additionally, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different world for kids growing up today than it was even 20 years ago. The stressors are truly more significant. The um, and not just the stressors on children, but the stressors on parents. And of course, anxiety and depression tr seems to trickle down from, um, from parents to a large degree. So I think in terms of what are we missing, certainly uh, accessibility to care, but also, and it's a critical piece, we're missing the comprehensive conversation about all of the variety of reasons and, and situations that might place children and adolescents at risk. And what seems to happen following a suicide and, fo and following a mass shooting as well, um, there, there's conversation that, that exists as we navigate through trauma. But in terms of the ongoing conversation about our society and about the implications of uh, violence, whether it be self-directed or other directed, that conversation seems to stop as people become, as we all become defensive and we enter our, our silos. 
and, uh, and say, well, it's not me. I don't have a, a part in finding the solution. But we're, if we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. So <clears throat> long answer. Um, I, I don't know that, what are we missing? You know, every 100 minutes, a teenager commits suicide. And anybody who works in mental health knows this, this is an epidemic. And it's got to stop. And we, need, we adults need to come together and, and uh, talk honestly about it. Mm -hmm. and Trevor, I see you nodding quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, you just, you've hit on so many really great points there, and especially that piece of having that comprehensive conversation. I feel like it's so easy to just sort of dismiss um, the clues, even though we start to kind of pick up on something might be wrong. It's really easy to just sort of say, well, don't say that, or don't talk like that. Right. And then we kind of, we move on instead of asking those questions. Right. Are you considering suicide? Is there anything I can do to, to support you and to help you? And if not me, who else can you go to? If, if, if it's not me, um, parent, grandparent, um, is there an aunt, an uncle, a neighbor, a school counselor, a teacher? Who can we, um, who can we connect to with? Is it with? still uncomfortable for us to do that? It, it takes us out of our comfort zone to approach someone, especially a teenager, and say, are you considering suicide? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, but what we know is that people are generally pretty honest when we actually ask the question. They will, they will tell you, yeah, I have thought about this. And that opens the door then for us to either say, um, well, you know, we can talk about that, or let's get you connected to somebody who is qualified to support you in this. Mm -hmm. And I think a key piece of that is, is that Talking about suicide does not increase suicide, and I think that that's always a fear. And then also, what if they say yes? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And that's a point where, as an adult, an outside person, you know, it, there's there's resources. If worst case scenario, there's 911. I mean, if you don't know, I mean, there's places to go. There's um, text lines. There's um, phone, you know, phone lines, uh, emergency rooms, all types of, you know, your primary care doctor, there's places to go for help. So you don't have to have the answer. You just have to be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And Tamara, this is where you come in is finding those resources and making sure this, at least this community, the Spokane, greater Spokane area, um, is providing those resources. Well, I think, um, in saying that, yes, we're trying to do our best with what we have. As what Dr. Hyde says, we don't have all the access that we need all the time uh, for the level of care that's needed. Um, and so, you know, um, our community is uh, works really well together, and we're we're always trying to find out what is the next thing we can do together. Um, and it's even because uh, the emergency room is the place to go when you don't know what to do, but the emergency room isn't the place that fixes it. We try to find you know the resources in the community. Um, is there is there a need for this person to be in an inpatient environment? Um, and when we talk as as we talk about um, these related topics of um, you know depression and anxiety, often it isn't um, it isn't the right answer to go to an inpatient facility. And so finding those resources out in the community, um, unfortunately, can be a challenge. It could even take you know several weeks to several months to get the right clinicians on board, whether it be a psychiatrist, psychologist, a, a licensed therapist. So, and do we have enough? Uh, no, and I, and I don't think that it's not a. Say a Spokane um, issue, everybody knows this is a national issue um, every way go and as um, the fact is is that we're getting attention now and we need to take that and, and, and build and roll with that. It's really important and I feel like we're doing that in Spokane with Providence and our community partners. And when I talk about community partners, it's not just the, the ones who provide mental health services but emergency services as well. Mm -hmm. And in the, the broader discussion, are we starting early enough with kids? Are we taking their mental health as seriously as we are their physical health and treating it on the same level? No. You should have a checkup, for right. instance, you know, every right. year for your mental health as right. you do your physical health. Right. You know, I think a lot of uh, family practice uh, clinics and, and uh, general physician clinics are starting to see the value of bringing it in uh, LICSWs and uh, uh, different therapists to provide that uh, frontline um, support, mental health support for their patients. 
population. And, those, and there are some of those clinics here in Spokane, and that's a tremendous thing. But I, but I think you're exactly right. That needs to be an integral part of good, a good uh, medical home is also access to, to mental health providers and, uh, and assessment of young children. Mm -hmm. And if this became a, a piece of just the way we raise our kids, would we see less suicides, in your opinion, Trevor? We can't speak to that. We just we just don't really know. I think the hope is there that any level of prevention and intervention is going to, um, as early on, is going to be helpful. Um, but we, I just don't know that we can mm -hmm. say that for sure. Mm -hmm. Let's talk uh, about the signs. What are we watching for, Kathy? So we're watching for you know changes in behavior, um, changes in sleep and eating. So you can have a kid who's sleeping way too much, or they're sleeping too little. Um, you know, potentially giving away possessions, talking about death, blogging, looking up sites, anything like that. Um, and again, asking the question, it's okay to ask. And I think that we were scared to ask. Um, and so any statement about suicide, whether joking or not, should be taken seriously to not necessarily that, oh, pull the panic button here, but to begin the conversation. Okay, what is really going on? Um, you know, also in light of uh, the suicide down at uh, Washington State, you have to, you know, as a community, mental health community, we're very concerned about copycat suicides, that someone on the outside can look like they have everything going for them, so um, it's easy for it to look at that and say, well, if they had all this and killed themselves, what about me? What do I have? Um, and I'm not gonna make it. And that's where you know we, we can all put up um, pretty good window dressings of what looks like our best moment, and especially on social media. So with kids thinking, I, I don't have all those friends, or you know, people post their best moment, not their worst. Um, and do comparisons, and that's the same with suicides. Um, so that's definitely a, a concern of mine. Well, and I think, yeah, I think that's what's so heart-wrenching about these cases is that when you have somebody that appears to have it all, so how, how do you recognize those signs? Or if it's your child who's away at college and you're not speaking to them on a regular basis or on a daily basis, that can be very difficult to yeah. spot. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, it can be very difficult and sometimes impossible. But, but we need to continue to uh, assume that it's not impossible. And we need to continue to, to reach out and continue to express to, to teens, to students, that if they are struggling, there, there is somebody who can come alongside of them and, and, and help them. Hopelessness and helplessness are... Um, can be lethal feelings, can lead to lethal um, behavior. So if, if we can do nothing else other than send the message to young folks who are feeling hopeless that there is hope of ill, there is a possibility that one can get better. Because most people, most people attempt suicide will tell you that they don't want to die. They want to stop hurting. Mm -hmm. And they're hopeless. They feel hopeless. They've lost hope that they will ever feel good again. I think another thing just to add on is, is that um, what I see a lot in my practice is kids and teens and college not being able to, to really communicate with their parents and not finding, being able to find the words. And it's the same with parents. And I think the, you know, finding ways to articulate and um, just for uh, you know a small recommendation sometimes I give uh, kids the option well could it be like this or like this and sometimes I say no it's not like that it's like this <laughs> and you're like okay but sometimes it's like where to start it's like just getting the conversation going is the hardest part and I think that that's one of the big things of that people can do to help is start the conversation. Well, and I just think it can be enormously validating to um, 
be able to have somebody listen to you non-judgmentally and to be able to have them say it's okay to have these thoughts and sometimes that's pretty common for teenagers to have these thoughts maybe I've had them too when I was your age and there's a big difference between having these kinds of thoughts and starting to make plans and taking actions I have a lot of teenagers in my office who are well am I gonna get locked away if I start talking about this stuff or like, be well, in trouble yeah am I gonna get in trouble um, I don't want to go to a psych unit well let's talk about that a little bit because here's how that works and I can kind of just demystify it a little bit validate it it's okay for us to sit here and talk about the thoughts um, my big concern is when we start to have a plan in place and we're starting to collect things and and to make this plan happen at that point we will maybe be talking about getting some extra support but for right now, let's start at square one here. But getting them into your office is a big piece of that. Right. And for, for parents, it's difficult. Um, we know if we've you know, had teenagers that they can be moody. It's, you know, it's an interesting time for adolescents. And so how do I know the difference? Well, we talked to a, another expert about that very topic. So if you have teenagers, you're a grandparent, or you work with teenagers, what should you be watching for um, when it comes to depression? Hi, I'm Katherine Anderson, a family therapist at Sacred Heart Children's Hospital, and I'm going to show you five warning signs that a teenager you care about may be depressed. So what's key in all five of these is to know what is typical of your teenager, because all five signal an abrupt shift in what's going on with this teen. Number one is irritability. What is your teen's normal mood? And is there a shift towards being more irritable? Not just, I had a rough test, I had a breakup or an argument with my parents, but I'm irritable out of context and that irritability doesn't fade away. Persistent irritability, warning sign number one. Warning sign number two, withdrawing. Is your teen pulling away from people or activities that they care about? Not just typical teenager doesn't want to spend as much time with their family, but truly disengaging from relationships that often mattered to them, hobbies or passions they used to care about. Warning sign number two, withdrawing. Warning sign number three, abrupt shifts in friends. Not only could your teen be pulling away from friendships, are they creating new groups of friends that's very out of character for them, out of context with their normal interests? Warning sign number three, abrupt shifts in friends. Warning sign number four, irregular sleep patterns. This one's a little tricky because teenagers tend to have shifts in their sleep a lot. But this is where if you know your teen tends to benefit from a lot of sleep and all of a sudden they're staying up all night or vice versa, your teen tends to function really well with not a lot of sleep and now they're going all day long wanting to nap, sleeping all the time, that can be a signal as well. So warning sign number four, irregular sleep patterns for what is typical for your teen. Warning sign number five, too much screen time. This one's tough for our society because we all kind of need to function with screens. What I'm talking about is when a kid is so plugged in to either their phone, their computer, their TV, to the point where they are shutting out anything but the virtual world, that can be a warning sign that they may be depressed especially if you try to pull them away and pull them back into their lives. That could serve as a warning sign, too much screen time. Now it's important to remember that not just one or all five of these warning signs is a guarantee that your teen is depressed. Any of us can get irritable, pull away from relationships, start new ones, need a little extra sleep, or want to spend all afternoon watching TV. These are simply warning signs to keep an eye out just in case your teenager is depressed. Very good advice. Dr. Hyde, would you like to expand on anything that Catherine said? No, she said it all. <laughs> she covered it very well. Yes. Um, as parents, that is tough, to, yes. especially to recognize more than one or two of those signs and right. to become concerned right. and as parents we we have too much screen time as well and so maybe right. we're not paying as close right. attention right. as as we should yeah. and kids teenagers having raised two of them 
don't want to open up. They yeah. just don't want to talk to mom and dad. Sure. So how do we crack that nut? Yeah. <clears throat> I always tell parents, you know your child better than anyone else. Um, sometimes they think they don't, but they do. And so what you heard Catherine talk about was changes uh, that these children will present with, with changes that maybe only parents can truly be attentive to. So that's the key word, attentive. We have to remain attentive and be available to, to watch, to spend time with, and then to ask the question, like Trevor was saying, listen. And we listen for the words and we listen for the meaning behind the words because it's in the meaning that we find the feeling. And it's the feeling that will drive the, the mood. So, um, so we need to pull back a little as parents um, from the lecturing and the here's what right. I expect of you and here's you know, we need to and listen more. that doesn't more. provide a safe environment. So Trevor talked about in his therapy, he provides this safe environment where kids feel they can express themselves without ridicule, challenge, confrontation. And that um, it is safe to talk about the real thoughts, real feelings in the presence of an adult that will be accepting and, um, and provide uh, this model that communication can, can really be safe. I think on top of that is parents need to be kind of willing and open to hear things they don't want to hear. And it's not always easy. It's yeah. not always easy, but um, to have them, have kids be able to say, I made a mistake, and not have the knee-jerk reaction, but okay, you made a mistake, but I value you more than doing something right, and we'll figure out how to get through this together. And some direction there. And sometimes kids are hiding mistakes, feeling they're going to disappoint trying to take care of parents versus parents trying to take care of kids there. Um, you know, worrying about the stress on their parents, worrying about being perfect, consequences. And the biggest message needs to be we're going to get through this together. It's going to be okay. Trevor, what do the kids tell you, uh, especially about their parents? What do they say? with that relationship when you finally can, can get through to them and they ha have a frank discussion with you? Well, I would say uh, m most of the time they want to be able to talk to parents about these issues. Um, and a lot of times, just like uh, Kathy said, it's that, that fear of disappointing them. I've, I've, I've found that even some of the most defiant um, youth at their core really value their parents' opinion of them. And if, um, so being able to to help parents understand that yes, you do matter, and um, being able to monitor your reaction when they do come to you with things is just going to promote this culture of um, open communication that's going to be so rewarding in the long run. I think I love what you said there about um, I value you more than this this behavior, this mistake, and being able to make sure that that's communicated inherently um, is is going to go a long ways. And because we do live in different times, it is difficult. The kids have seem to have more pressure on them when it comes to what we expect of them, um, when it comes to school. And, and then there's the social media piece that none of us had growing up. And I can't even imagine how, how much of a pressure that is to deal with, especially with kids that are being bullied or um, that it, are having to deal with that yeah. on top of everything else. And there's more and more being written about um, the, the reality that children and adolescents today have no downtime. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, always, they're either plugged in electronically or they're plugged into school or they're plugged into something organized. Those are good things. They can be great, great things. But it's interesting, the research continues to, to look at this issue, lack of downtime and inability to just collect self and to it's in it, it's in that it's in those moments of silence that we learn so much about ourselves and we we grow in competency and mastery and then there's this thought that kids don't have access to those moments of silence mm. that's, that's very interesting yeah the times that we had, you know, we were bored. Well, it's okay to be bored occasionally. <laughs> and kids aren't bored anymore. There's Correct. always something. Um, there's always something going on. 
Let's uh, switch topics from depression to anxiety, which sort of um, fits right into that uh, as well. It, the anxious, kids are anxious um, for any number of reasons. Talk about exactly what we're talking about, Trevor, when we talk about anxiety. Well, and depression and anxiety are really just kind of best friends. They just, they tend to like to hang out together quite a bit um, anyway. And it really follows right along with what Dr. Hyde was saying in that um, w without being able to cope with boredom, which I really see as a manifestation of anxiety on some level, um, being able to sit with that, sit with my thoughts, not have a screen, something to interact with, um, is is how we can learn to cope with anxiety and um, it, it, without having that that ability to reflect and to sit and calm ourselves that self-soothing peace we become really reliant on uh, stimulus and entertainment and um, which then we start to avoid and uh, you can probably speak a lot to this <laughs> that the more we avoid the bigger the anxiety yeah, right. how does it manifest well, I think right now I would say I've never seen so much um, obsessive compulsive behavior in my life and in very young kids with um, very extreme fears, um, extreme fears that bad things were going to happen to their parents, they're not going to be okay, um, you know, which can manifest in, you know, separation, separation anxiety, um, problems concentrating in school where they're just preoccupied. Um, hand washing, counting, all of those kinds of behaviors. And that's a um, more extreme form of uh, anxiety disorders. But basically, I would say the underlying feeling of an anxiety disorder is I'm not okay. It, the world is not okay. I'm not safe. And that emotion and what it drives and what kids and adults will do to try to feel safe. Are they exposed to too much information? Are they getting, where's it coming from? I think it's coming from a, a number of sources. One is is that, you know, there's economic uncertainty right now. And we know that um, mental health disorders, suicides um, increase during those times. Um, are, you know, there's not a sense of everything's going to be okay in our country, a time of great prosperity. You're going to have a great job. You're going to have a house. You're going to, all of this stuff. So you look at our um, adolescents and college kids, you know, they have a, a great number of anxieties around that. Parents do. Um, and the little, the smaller kids, the younger children are picking that up. Yes. And even if their parents aren't political, what's really interesting is um, I still see young kids who will mention things and their parents are quite shocked at like, well, we don't have the news on we don't you know discuss these things and it's like they're picking it up also at school from their peers so maybe you're being good about not having you know news on I think news is a horrible thing for young kids to watch because it's so tragedy focused and kids need to feel secure mm -hmm. to thrive. Mm -hmm. Tamara do we have enough available especially for the younger children um, as far as facilities and care go and where we send um, teenagers and kids? Um, well, the, the resounding answer is no, we don't. Um, right now in our community, we do see a lot of people, children as young as five and six in our emergency room um, with uh, issues related to anxiety, depression, um, behavior issues, and then we see a lot of um, adolescents and of course adults, we all know that that's an issue. Um, we have seen in our emergency room at Sacred Heart, the, the pediatric emergency room, um, a double our numbers in the kids under 12 that are coming to, coming to seek care. Um, and by the time those age groups come to our emergency room, it's pretty significant. It isn't, um, it isn't uh, um, well, I just want to get them checked out. It is, I cannot handle this anymore because, because of their behaviors that they're having. So it's behavior issues, and that's why parents are taking to the, to the emergency room? Yeah, usually it's how it manifests in children in the younger ages. Is it, it comes out in really poor behaviors, violence, and self-directed violence, and so forth. And um, inability, you know, towards even their, sometimes, they, they, most of the time what drives them in is that violence with other children in the, in the environment, and they're scared for their family. Um, and, and um, and like I said, it has doubled. And so we don't have, um, you know, we have a program, a day program called the best program in Providence. Um, fantastic. Um, we, we hold, it's a five week program and we have 14 kids in the program at a time. It continually rotates. Uh, and we usually have three or four month waiting list. 
uh, and our schools are our primary source of, uh, of referrals. So that tells you the problem that we have with the adolescent, or I mean the, the younger children, um, and we on our inpatient access for those age groups right now, we don't have that access at Sacred Heart. Uh, Kootenai Behavioral Health over in Coeur d'Alene um, has the ability to care for those kids um, and, they, and they will help with those. But they, they face the same problem in their emergency room and in their region as well being uh, an inpatient regional facility. And then uh, uh, Seattle Children's. And so we really don't have the access for those under 13, under 12, 13 year olds. Um, and often it's, uh, it's a case where um, people hear about boarding and we do have um, young children that will stay in our ED for a long time while we're trying to figure out to stabilize them and figure out what the best plan is for them. And what? The, other, the other thing that's concerning about that is we're sending our youngest kids oftentimes across the state um, if Kootenai is full and you know, then their parents are here. Not everybody has the ability to be going over there, staying over there, visiting, and they're young kids. I mean, think of how scary that is and how much we need those resources here. And, and I would have to say that even though we have resources for the, the, the 12 and 13 to 18 year olds, um, the, the issues are similar. Um, we don't have enough inpatient facilities, we don't have enough of the appropriate acuity level outpatient. Um, I will I will say that the hope in our community is, you know, we have a lot of changes happening over the next year with the introduction of the joint venture between um, um, United Health Systems and Providence to bring a 100 bed hospital, which will have more adolescent beds and adult beds. Um, we have, you know, the opportunity to start looking to, can we start providing that children's service now that we'll have some more adolescent beds? Um, I'd have to say, um, as part of a strategy for f through Providence and with our community partners, we have a lot of outpatient services that we're looking to open um, in, the, in those mid-level, where um, it's kind of like our best program, where we don't want you to be in the hospital, we want you to right. come here for five weeks and learn how to, how to express your feelings and how to deal with your impulsive and your anger issues. Um, same way is, as this is a perfect topic for um, anxiety and depression is as we move forward in that intermediate, Providence will be opening one up for adolescents and adults here in the very near future within probably uh, the next several months. And so that'll, that'll will help because now you go to the emergency room and we can say, well, it sounds like you need to come to this program. Right. And it's very similar to our very successful BEST program, which is for the children. And so it's very exciting because there is a lot going on. It takes a long time to build that momentum. Um, and that's just one thing of the many, many exciting things that uh, we're working on within the community to, to, to go from, you know, the pediatrics, primary care and pediatrics and some of the specialty units. And, and Tamara, yeah. for those parents that are so frustrated and get to that point where they take the kids to the emergency room, what's your best advice for them rather than get to that point? What, what phone calls should they make or who, who should they reach out to for that matter rather than getting to that point where they end up in the emergency room? Yeah. Well, I think it was already discussed earlier. I mean, go, your primary care provider. Um, unfortunately, the way that we've had to handle mental health issues in our communities throughout the nation is the primary care physician is the default mental health pro uh, um, professional. So that's a really good choice because they um, they are not experts, but they also they've had experience. Um, it is to start reaching out to counseling services early so that you can get into those into those. Um, obviously, we always want to tell people to, to you know, come to the emergency room if it gets to the point you don't know what your resources are. Um, it's just really important to at least try to find them out. And, and it, as we know, healthcare in general is very complex, um, especially for full functioning families. But when you have a family that doesn't function as well um, for multiple reasons or just because they have one um, person who is a child causing a lot of havoc in their life, they don't know where to turn. And so... Um, and, and then I, I have to mention, you know, first call for help, which I know the number has been up. They are a fantastic resource for just calling and say, what do I do? It doesn't have to necessarily be, I'm in a bad place right now, but I just need some information. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of resources out there for that, where do I start? And, and I think there's less access for, as we're becoming very complex, how, do I, how does it get managed now? Mm -hmm. We have an email coming into the show, which is, is timely for the discussion right now. What if your troubled teenager totally refuses counseling. You as a parent want to seek counseling for your child and they simply won't go. What do you do? You, you talk to somebody yourself. You go see a therapist. You go see a Trevor, Kathy, and you talk and you, and you ask for their input and their advice. They may have some, some recommendations as to how to 
access uh, your child into conversation about getting help. Um, or they may have some, uh, based on what you tell them, they may have some other suggestions. Uh, things may, may be dangerous. And, um, and the child may be at greater risk than you as a parent even imagine. And they will have the, um, the, the experience to, to, to assist you mm -hmm. either way. Mm -hmm. And Trevor, you've seen that. Have you seen that? Have you had parents in your office that are Absolutely. frustrated because they can't get their teenager in? Absolutely. And um, while it is, you know, ideal and essential that it's that that child's want to be there and want to get the support, sometimes it it, um, it needs to be sort of a conversation on letting them know there's this resource available. When you're ready, let us know, and we'll make sure that we're here for you. And Can you so, give them some tools to, to then approach their teenager and, and try some different approaches? Absolutely. To seek that care? Some really great communication strategies that can can be uh, used really in just opening the door to that conversation. Um, being really mindful not to make therapy a, a consequence or sort of that, that threat that we're holding over their head or these kinds of but being able to let them know, hey, you know, this is a possibility. Uh, maybe you have a relative who's been in counseling. They can talk to you a little bit about it. But just letting them know it's there. And when you're ready, we'll, we'll go there. Mm -hmm. I think the other piece of that is, is that finding a counselor that's a good fit is mm -hmm. imperative. So taking your child to counseling, if it's not a good fit, there's really not a point. And I think trying to find that person um, you know, one of the things that I try to do, I do a lot of art and narrative therapy, which seems less intimidating to kids. It's it's an easier way of engaging. And there's people in town who do different things, and it just really helps increase comfort level. And so I think going seeking out more of a child and an adolescent therapist, um, you know, that we have more experience in dealing with that, our offices are usually much more fun mm -hmm. and <laughs> with lots of toys. And, um, and it's just more of a relaxing feel. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you have a good fit? Um, several things. I mean, one is, I mean, at the end of the first session, I ask, is this comfortable? Um, you know, when I have a family, any kind of person in front of me seeking services, it's about them. It's about their comfort, and um, if I'm not the right person for them, it's part of my job to help find the right person and give them recommendations. And I think doing those periodic check-ins, and same with a consumer being able to say, uh, no, you don't seem right for me. <laughs> that's a that's a f okay conversation, and people need to be empowered to um, say that and to ask for different therapists, and, you know, and that's a... And kids are usually fairly open about those sort of things, especially the younger kids. They'll let you know. Oh, yes, they will. <laughs> oh, yeah. They yeah. will let you know pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and they have a lot of fears. Are you going to tell my parent everything that um, I say? And it's like, no, that's not part of, you know, there's confidentiality. And then there's parts where, you know, you're working with a teen to, why don't we talk to your parent together? And kind of helping them do that. Mm -hmm. so. What are some of their concerns? Do they, it, it, do they feel like there's going to be a stigma attached to them because they're in counseling? Um, if people are going to call them crazy. I, I can only imagine what things go through it, uh, a, a kid's head. One of the biggest things that I see, even with small kids, not being able to find words to describe what's going on inside of them. So then, you know, how do I connect with my parent? How do I say what's going on? And the other thing is sometimes parents really, especially teens, step back quite a bit thinking, oh, they want to be with their friends, this is better, they're happier, and it's no, teens need you. They need you even more, and um, kind of letting go of the tug-of-war rope is not good. <laughs> they fall. And yes, they're challenging, and they're trying to find their own way, but they need you involved. Okay. 
-hmm. I want to remind everyone, too, we've, we've talked about a lot of phone numbers and information tonight, and you will be able to find those on our website, which is ksps.org, um, on the Health Matters page. Just go there, and we've put a lot of information as part of the discussion tonight um, with phone numbers and other information that you can certainly access at ksps.org. I, I was surprised when I reached out to all four of you um, to talk about topics for tonight's program, and you all mentioned ADHD, and I was surprised that it fell uh, within the discussion tonight. And why is that, Dr. Hyde? First because of all, describe what ADHD is. Yeah, ADHD is, uh, there are different kinds of ADHD, but ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. <clears throat> ADHD doesn't look the same in all kids or adults. Um, there are, this is a, Everybody has moments of time when they don't concentrate, they don't focus, they don't pay attention. This is a, this is a, a condition that tends to be uh, sustained across situations, home and school, for kids. And so a kid will experience, both at home and school, difficulties attending, focusing, concentrating, um, inhibiting their behavior, um, and uh, learning in a, in a sequential sort of way. There's actually neuropsychological differences in uh, the brains of the kids with ADHD and without ADHD. And uh, we can actually uh, provide testing, psychometric testing that can assist us in terms of understanding whether kids' difficulties with attention, focus, distractibility, uh, or function of ADHD or something else. And there's a, there's a, uh, if, if parents want to really learn about ADHD, the premier author, I, I think, nationally on ADHD is Russell Barkley. So Russell Barkley will talk a lot about distractibility as being the key issue. Kids who have ADHD, and he will say, everybody has problems with attention. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's a, it's, we, it's, a, it's a misnomer. What we really want to focus on is distractibility. So can our child, once distracted, reattend hmm. in, internally or not? That, he will say, will be the key variable that we need to identify. So there is ADHD, there is uh, inattentive type, ADHD and attentive type, those are the kids who, who just they're not hyperactive, they're not impulsive, they just have problems attending and, and problems with distractibility. And then there are the ADHD impulsive hyperactive type. There's, those are the kids that are probably readily you know, observable. Uh, and then there are kids that have both ADHD and um, ADHD and attentive type and ADHD hyperactive impulsive type. Those, we call those combined, ADHD combined type. But it really is an impairing disorder and undiagnosed can lead, ADHD undiagnosed in a child can lead to depression, anxiety in adolescence. So from a preventative standpoint, if we have concerns about our child's ability to, to attend and, and inhi inhibit their behavior, it's good to have an evaluation. Um, it, it can be preventative uh, or can prevent uh, further uh, deterioration in terms of depression, anxiety. So what are we watching for? Kathy? Um, so one of the things watching for, I mean, I think uh, school performance, certainly. Um, what Can it be recognized in children that are preschool age? Yes. Younger? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can. Um, I think, uh, you know, you find those kids that are spacing off or, you know, you've tried to get them to listen 5,000 times and it's like, hello, look at me, look at me, focus me, <laughs> um, and they just can't do it. So some of that, um, one of the things is that by not treating, by not looking at it, kids usually experience a lot of failures. And that's one of the biggest things about seeking any kind of mental health treatment. The earlier you seek it, the less failures. And that history of failures just really um, is exponential in, in the impact. So I think with the adolescent depression and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So how do you treat it? I mean, I know there are some drugs available to treat it, but also can you help a child learn focusing tips? Yes. Um, so mindfulness, I think, is out of Stanford about um, looking at like yoga and breathing, um, some things like that. 
Um, there's always strategies for uh, managing. So just because your child has ADHD doesn't mean the automatic um, solution is put them on meds. And I think that's a lot of reasons people don't want to seek an evaluation because they think medication is the only answer. And there's not. There's lots of strategies. Mm -hmm. Trevor, mm -hmm. you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, looking at severity too. So if this is a pretty low impact and we're catching things pretty early, some time management skills, I love mindfulness, and I know that um, there's some biofeedback therapies that could be really helpful as well, kind of up and coming stuff. Um, as it gets more severe, sometimes we really are kind of looking at those medications. Um, and not that they need to be maybe long term or, or completely forever, but to open that door so that we can learn some skills. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we have another email coming into the program. What does the WISE program offer? W-I-S-E, I'm not familiar with that. Who can speak to that? So it stands for Wraparound Intensive Services. Um, and so that is um, a little bit of that middle ground piece, the next step up from outpatient um, youth involved in my, and you can jump in if, if I'm getting this wrong, but <laughs> um, uh, youth in, in a WISE program have a team of people to support them at home, mm -hmm. at school. They have generally someone who's on call 24 seven. They have someone to support the parent um, or the caregiver. Um, they have a, a youth peer who can take them to go do some stuff and learn and practice coping skills. Um, and so it's just that, that wonderful next step up for if they meet criteria for, this, for these services. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that team approach in, in medicine so often. It sounds, it sounds so logical mm -hmm. that you have a team working with you if, if you have a child who's, who's suffering from a, a mental health disorder. Right. Yeah, it does take a village, you know. It does take a village. We're, we're blessed in Spokane. Historically, Spokane, compared to many cities uh, our size, um, we, we've always had a mental health community and medical community that, that work together. And so we've always been less fragmented in terms of our care delivery than many other cities mm -hmm. our size. And, and that's always been a pleasant thing. And, and I think that's even increasing as we, we just heard from Tamara talk about the programs and those are, that's not just Providence, but that's, you know, a, a group of providers coming together and providing and offering their input and support as to what, what's necessary and how can we make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, the entire nation has an opioid problem now, epidemic proportion. That's affecting kids um, on so many levels because we have parents that are involved. These kids are, are you know, having to deal with, with that that adds a whole new level to what we're, we're de dealing with as far as how to seek care. Yeah. Um, and I think that we're going to really see that evolve as we've seen all the state and federal legislature that's going through for and the financial support. Um, in general, um, addictive ser services is really underfunded and uh, access is even worse than it is for the street mental health community. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's going to be uh, really interesting as that unfolds as everybody is recognizing it just as that you know the last couple of years they've recognized that mental health has oh we have a problem and it's it's getting out of control um, the opio, op opioid uh, epidemic is something they're recognizing as well and um, I'm, I'm excited to see where that leads um, in our community as we look at um, educating our uh, new resident physicians because we have such a, a large medical residency program here and um, I've already seen differences um, within our uh, WSU Providence psychiatric um, residency program and their team based approach and their thought processes surrounding uh, mental health and co-occurring illnesses such as drug addiction so um, I think it's going to be a really exciting time for us because we're actually we're recognizing it and not only are Spokane recognizing it or individual providers, but the nation's recognizing it. Um, so it's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, you know, which kind of even going back to Kevin in the beginning of, you know, something happens and we talk about it and then it, we all go back and things go back. And the reality is suicide is the second leading cause of death for that, um, you know, late adolescent to early college kids. And... If we put the same amount of funding as we do to heart disease for adults, which is the second leading cause there, I mean, think of the differences of what we would have and what we could be prevented. 
And so funding is just still not there for any, any of these services, as much as we're excited about what we're you know, going to achieve now, but it still has a long way to go. But, but I think that goes along with the conversation earlier of, you know, we've treated medical care one way and mental health one way. And I think um, at a Providence St. Joseph health care system level, we're talking about primary care and our, our entry points of, okay, when do we do a mental health assessment? How often do we do it? And as we roll that forward, be able to identify those earlier. And so we're not waiting until the parents come in like, oh my gosh, this is happening and in in it's way out of a primary care physician's uh, of, um, tool, bag of tools that they have. So I think that, um, you know, you wouldn't, um, you, you wouldn't um, make people wait for heart surgery in an emergency room for three weeks, whether waiting for a bed or something to that effect. Um, so it's not, it's, it isn't equal. And we, and we need to continue to remind people it is a disease and that we need to try to make it more equal for access and equal for um, just the recognition that it's, it's not their fault and that it is a, it's, a, it's a disease of their mind most often. Mm -hmm. so. Take the stigma off of it. Mm -hmm. it. It's been far too long that we've allowed this to yeah. to come in second. Yeah, it, it really is. And so what would you, what would be your hope, Dr. Hyde, as we move forward? And, and it is it has been a priority, especially this week, um, a chance to, to shine a light on it and say we really need to take this more seriously. Suicide? Suicide, mental health in general. So uh, <clears throat> I have hope that I have a hope that someday, all the uh, uh, different actors in um, uh, life that the groups, professional groups, uh, that uh, um, businesses, kinds of industries that impact a child and adolescent's life will come together and sit down and talk about what they're doing well and what they're uh, doing poorly. And we'll have a conversation without becoming defensive and without retreating to silos. And that seems to happen um, after about 48 hours after a tragedy. People retreat to their silos. And they will say, well, no, it's not me. It's not my industry. It's not the violence that I uh, portray on TV. It's not the video games. It's not the guns. It's not." It's not the mental health laws, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not. I hope the day will come when we can sit down and say, it's all those things. It's the internet, it's the cyberbullying, it's the you know, constant access to, to reminders for kids of what they have done poorly that day because it's on video and it's, it's sent viral to hundreds of uh, readers and uh, shame is only a Twitter feed away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I hope, that's my hope, that we can come together and have those yeah. conversations. I don't think that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the internet. It, it can be um, both your friend and your enemy. Yes. Um, because it is can be a wonderful tool uh, for some things, but again, it can also um, be devastating, especially for teenagers and young kids who are either using the social media platforms or the, the internet on such a level like we've never seen before, Trevor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I, I love what you said. That there's no, um, there's no escaping it. I feel like a, a few years ago, dealing with bullies and these awful things, you could come home and have a family dinner and watch TV and dread the next day you had to go back to it. Well, it's it's following you. It's coming in um, in your backpack and in your pocket, um, and it's just this constant torment. And absolutely a wonderful, powerful tool. I use the internet every day. We look at YouTube breathing videos and coping skills and um, use this wonderful resource. Um, but being able to be really mindful that it is a very powerful tool. And when we start to spend too much time on social media, we start to see that there's a, a serious connection in increased depression, increased anxiety. We don't know what's causing what right now as far as I know, but um, there definitely seems to be some sort of a connection. And so that uh, looking at every, uh, everybody else's posts and feeling like you're missing out, even though you're perfectly content doing what you're doing, you're still this, this eating away, this anxiety that I could be doing something better or my friends are doing something and I'm missing out. And 
it just gets to be too much. Well, including um, using uh, like tracker apps, so you know where people are, you know where your yeah. friends are, you know, oh, they're getting together, I'm not part of it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it so there's just levels that, you know, we really don't understand or know, you know, of conversations that are happening. Um, yeah, as much as we'd like to think we're monitoring our kids, I think there's far more going on than we'll ever know. Right. Yeah, far more. Um, and, one, and what's interesting about that, just to add in, is that kids are less likely to come to you with the less you know. And so download the apps that they have, learn to use them, have them teach you. It's pretty funny to watch um, <laughs> as they just roll their eyes at you at your lack of experience. But, um, you know, trying out, seeing where the pitfalls of those apps are is... That's interesting, you know, we, we teach our late stage kids and, and younger, don't talk to strangers. Well, what they, and, they, and they maybe don't talk to strangers at the park, but, but come home and we'll get on a chat room and have a lengthy conversation with, all, with multiple strangers. That's frightening. And we should be frightened by that as parents. Yeah, and there, there are devices you can put on a computer and, and block certain websites, and parents need to be aware of those too as well to make sure that we are using the Internet as, as a positive tool that it can be. And that's okay to do that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Let your kids be mad at you for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't hurt. The other piece of that, though, is, is that there's so many, you know, you can say, oh, you're taking away electronics, but there's so many different uh, ways of accessing mm -hmm. that um, really trying to instill judgment for them, being able to say, well, I'm concerned about that. What do you see? Being more of a conversation, what's your judgment about it, um, is going to be ultimately more beneficial for your child. Perfect, Almost. perfect. We want to also let you know um, about a free community health forum coming up. It's Wednesday, January 31st. It is called Making Mental Health Essential Health. Perfect. It is held at the uh, Spokane Convention Center. The Honorable Patrick Kennedy is the keynote speaker. He is the co-author of the book called A Common Struggle, A Personal Journey Through the Past and Future of Mental Illness and Addiction. The doors will open at 5. The forum starts at 6 in the evening. And we have posted a link with all of the details on our website at ksps.org. Just look for the mental uh, or the uh, Health Matters tab on uh, ksps.org. And uh, that is going to do it for our show tonight. A very good discussion on the mental health of our kids and adolescents. I want to thank everyone who emailed their questions in tonight and our panel. And we will be back with another edi edition of Health Matters. Uh, join us on February 15th when our topic will be heart and stroke health. Until then, I'm Teresa Lukens. Good night. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Arnie Peterson, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I work at Sacred Heart for Providence Medical Group. When I needed my hip replaced, I chose Providence because of the professionalism and the care that I knew I'd receive. I never thought twice about going anywhere else. My name is Beth Perez, and I am a registered nurse, and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child, and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with, and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust? 